Uh, thank you all for coming here. Uh, I'm really uh, pleased to be able to introduce this, uh, this afternoon's talks, which uh, were organized by Atelier Luma in uh, Arles, in the Camargue region of France, which you'll uh, hear a lot more about uh, in, in a second. Um, you know, what, one of the reasons we're, we were so happy that uh, Atelier Luma uh, agreed to, to, to come here today uh, it was because, uh, as you may have seen, uh, the theme for this year's uh, fair is Elements Earth. And uh, especially in that uh, first hall over there, the Design at Large section, uh, we featured projects uh, by designers who are sort of rethinking and reimagining uh, materials, resources, and production at a time uh, of, of great change, uh, environmental change, but also social change. Um, I had the, the privilege of going to Arl uh, to see uh, Atelier Luma last fall, uh, and I have to say it, it, it's really incredible because they are, um, not only are, are they rethinking uh, and reimagining materials, resources, and production, but they're actually uh, putting it into practice or uh, applying it uh, in ways um, that uh, are, are very much rooted in the uh, ver changing demographic, uh, environmental, agricultural, economic, social uh, uh, shifts that are happening in that region, but in, in ways that, 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 that we can all learn from uh, elsewhere. So I'm um, very pleased to introduce uh, our, our, our speakers t today. Uh, we'll start with a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, between Maya Hoffman, who I think uh, needs no introduction, but uh, let's just say she's the, the legendary uh, patron, supporter, catalyst uh, for the arts and culture uh, in, in so many ways, and Jan Bolin, who among many other things, uh, is the artistic director for Atelier Luma. And so they'll do a, a, a very uh, brief one-on-one -on -one followed by a panel discussion. So please, uh, please welcome Jan and, and, and Maya. Thank you, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, yeah, uh, congratulations also with uh, choosing these kind of critical topics in this uh, kind of environments. Uh, no, it's not... Uh, not an easy moment, but uh, um, in in history to to address these kind of things, it's really urgent. Uh, it's urgent, um, and I'm happy therefore to be here. And um, I'm happy uh, because we want to share a kind of um, approach, an attitude, an uh, a kind of culture uh, how to deal with Earth. Uh, this is, um, I can say, Maya, um, how you uh, envisioned, in fact, uh, uh, Luma Foundation as a, uh, a cultural institute in Arles. Um, and sometimes people ask me, I'm going to be a bit uh, provoked, Arles, for God's sake, uh, why? There? How? Why all? Thank yeah. you, Jan, and thank you for inviting me again. Um, yeah, why Al? Um, Al for me is probably not the, has probably not the same signification than than, than for some outsider. I am practically b born there. Um, I was one week old when I arrived, and one month old. My sister, who is sitting here today, uh, also was there before me. <laughs> And uh, so um, there is actually a continuation for me for my Luma Foundation work in Arles, a continuation from the work that our father started um, with uh, the wetlands, first in Arles, protecting the wetlands, and then throughout the whole Mediterranean. It's protecting, but it's also studying. He's one of the fathers of ecology in the, in the modern sense of the word, um, a word that we reuse very often now also when we speak about culture in our vocabulary at Luma. So um, this started really for, for the Luma Foundation in Arles. Luma Foundation is existing since years in Switzerland, since 2004. And uh, we have a lot of uh, projects that are international and they're always, it's always been defined by helping other institutions or helping and supporting artists to produce, and it's not really a collecting uh, uh, entity, although sometimes the collecting is not prohibited. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we are quite open-ended with this. So, in the continuation of the, the, the wetlands and the pure study of the wetlands and the scientific work, I had two things when I was, uh, as I was growing up and later, uh, two ideas is, one is that you can help to protect the very protected areas by creating activities 
that are related to environment or related to nature. And so by doing this, you protect as well as when you freeze the reserves. I don't know if I, I make myself understand. Yes. So a cultural activity or an agricultural activity is a really a good uh, way to support this work of my father. So um, I started already in 2002 to uh, open an organic restaurant and to make some uh, organic agriculture um, as a protector to, to this. And at the, the same first, time, yeah. I was also involved in the photographic festival, mm -hmm. the Rencontre. And uh, this um, also motivated me to, to try and speak the language of culture in Arles. Arles is a big town. Mm -hmm. You have a, a, um, a center of town, which has, a natural, uh, which has the historical heritage. And then you have this very big land, which has a natural heritage. So the aim was always to put both together and then to support also this festival of photography and other cultural uh, institutions in Arles. And this is how also the Van Gogh Foundation got born out of this spirit. Great. Uh, that's uh, the starting point that is uh, bringing everything together today. We see here the landscape of the Camargue. Uh, it's, um, and there, um, that is in fact Parc des Ateliers. Parc des Ateliers, what, what does that mean, the, the atelier? And so there was always um, uh, this uh, factory, if you want, um, which was in the middle of the, the town, really adjacent to the old city adjacent to the railway, where uh, it was one of the biggest plants in the south of France to repair um, locomotives, to repair all the technical things for the whole of southern France. So this was um, all happening be behind walls. Mustafa, mm -hmm. who is here, can tell you how many people were working there. I don't remember. 1,200, yeah, 1,200 employees. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it, it closed. Uh, we were able to reopen it through the festival of photography. So through culture, as you mm -hmm. know, it's the regeneration of, um, of uh, factories, yeah. of compounds can be done. Yeah. landscapes. Yeah, for yeah. the summers. Um, so it's a production place since the beginning, actually. And uh, I thought it would be interesting to, for it to continue to be a production space. A space for production of art, culture, yeah. uh, contemporary dance, uh, archives, uh, yeah. knowledge production, mm. in fact. For the study, yeah. for research. For research. And? Atelier Luma. Atelier Luma. <laughs> yeah. uh, we are now looking to one of the, the events that happened uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, um, the Luma Days. That's. Uh, a kind of gathering where all aspects uh, come together that you just mentioned. The region, uh, the arts, uh, the science, the, the social aspects, the environmental aspects, all come together in one moment at uh, the end of May. Um, is that really this interdisciplinarity, uh, the, the core of uh, the Luma Foundation in Ireland? Yeah, it is, it is certainly. There is also this, and, and just um, uh, Arles is, is a town that tends to go to sleep in winter time, and so we picked a date with the start of the, the spring, um, when everybody feels like going, coming down, and to see some the sun and the things, and we called it Luma Days, and we gather all our, of our activities. Uh, I think we should speak about Atelier Luma because you don't, you didn't really explain wanted, what it is. I wanted to start to okay. speak about Luma Nights, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no Luma, Luma. I mean Atelier Luma is Luma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's Luma, <laughs> as we all know. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, no, there is pro there is production. Well, if this is what you wanted to of uh, artistic artistic programs that um, that take care that take place the, through the whole year, and for me. Uh, uh, the lab, the research lab, and the design lab is actually part of the program mm -hmm. at the same same um, um, importance than uh, the artistic production. Yeah, and then suddenly in 2016, got an invitation to come with some students uh, to do like a, a kind of field research uh, for 10 days. Uh, 
in the Camargue, uh, looking around, and we found materials, uh, reed, uh, salt, um, um, yeah, all kind of uh, stuff, and we started to experiment and try to see what we could make out of it, and that was a kind of spark or a moment where you thought, oh, here we can do something. And you, you asked to elaborate on that, and together with uh, ID City, researching also the region, uh, the city itself, uh, and then it started. It took me a while to understand what design thinking is, yeah. and suddenly I had um, I like um, this epiphany, like one of our best friends would say, <laughs> that uh, you actually can, um, you actually can, for, for you, if you are all designers, it seems normal, but for me it came out of, of another direction. Uh, that you can actually, you don't have to conform uh, to what you think it has to look like, but you can actually design your own desires, your own dreams, your own things. And I, I realized we were doing the same by working with Frank Gehry, mm -hmm. because it was a long process to make everything uh, happen, but it was always coming with, um, it's difficult to say, we, we wanted to do it and we were able to do it. So that's really what design thinking means for me. And uh, to be able to discuss about everything with people from different disciplines, with, uh, which are in that case not specialists anymore, but put their knowledge towards uh, the completion of something was really a, an eye opener. This being said, when uh, Jan came with um, his students, they were like trying to reinvent the, the wheel at the same time of everything that was existing in the Kamang. So I had a, a few uh, brum <laughs> with you because I said you cannot just send the, the students on their bicycles. They go in, they explain to everybody how to do the things. That's not the way it works. We are, we are, the society there is very yeah. organized. Yeah. It's agriculture. It's uh, super interesting. But little by little, the atelier since 2016 has been really taking the people in, listening, and that's why the Luma days are also so important. Uh, having the, 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 the mix of ideas really made a difference. Yeah, I think it uh, came out of a very simple, um, one simple rule uh, when we presented in, I think, August or September 2016. You said, okay, you can work here, but you have to collaborate. You just cannot come and do your thing here. Uh, if you do that, uh, it will fail and I won't support. So, and that became like uh, the starting base of all the endeavors, uh, all the, uh, the initiatives that we are taking in Atelier Luma is, or, and there you saw uh, the space we are working in. It's a laboratory, it's uh, 1,200 square meters. There are at this moment 17 people researching, but much more designers and people around the project are really building a, a big network. Um, it's a very active space. Uh, it's changing continuously. Uh, probably the team hates me because every, every four months uh, the whole space is new. It's uh, impermanency is also uh, something uh, you embrace and uh, I um, cannot say that I'm not against that and on the, on the contrary. Uh, impermanency, um, intuition and also um, interdisciplinarity are really the core of uh, Luma Foundation, I think. Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah, but, but that's where we are and where we uh, we want to become, and I'm going to make a, a story very, uh, a long story very short, is we are now doing research in that region, uh, and that doesn't look very clear, but uh, finally we want to become uh, a place for exchange of knowledge. So maybe a kind of, and we don't find the word yet, and maybe we'll never find a kind of post-academic research place where people come to exchange knowledge uh, to, to know what uh, this kind of LUMA formula is, uh, where all these different disciplines come together. Because what is exceptional, and at this moment that starts, is that also artists are coming in, the residents are coming in, we are doing research at this moment, and then on top of that, we get like super interesting questions of artists that say, can we do this, or did you see that? And then suddenly, new things are popping out. Yeah. Yeah. And 
Bien. Yeah, it is really the the we are just now in the first phase which is based on research and which is really exhilarating. We do research, but at the same time, Ian and his team are, are organizing exhibitions that are really more appealing to the public. Suddenly you can touch, you can see, you can uh, see up. This is from ours, yeah? Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really, really very, very interesting like that. Uh, this phase will be followed probably we will need to know how we can uh, we can accompany how we can guide to the next phase which would probably be a commercialization of certain of the of the things even more so for the designers who want maybe to do something so either you create prototypes or and these can be uh, tried in the huge um, um, uh, construction construction site that we have right now. So we have the, the opportunity to apply it directly so, to, to real, reality and study it also in the application. Or it becomes maybe uh, an object that is really saving the planet, so to say. Or, or on the verge, bit, on yeah. The, yeah, a Hopefully bit, a, a bit, little bit, yeah. uh, by creating uh, objects or usual materials that are less uh, harmful to the planet. So that's also under, an underlying thing. Yeah. The, the endeavor is really to rethink the 21st century economy towards a sustainable economy where all elements, and here you see some things like if we are talking about changing, this is the, the way how that we connect all the elements in the, in the space itself. This is last year here in uh, Miami uh, where we did a, a presentation and uh, we are looking to waste streams uh, in uh, looking what they can become. These materials are now already uh, like applied in the site itself because the site will become the showcase of all these exactly. uh, inventions. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So first you see uh, maybe bio-laminates, uh, but we are also looking to uh, issues that are around there today, like uh, the rice farmers are producing a lot of uh, waste and there is a tradition of uh, burning the rice, uh, the leftovers afterwards. What can we do with that? How can that be used in different ways? Uh, how can we use the landscape as uh, uh, to develop new colors, uh, dyes, uh, can they work for the, the wool of the Merino d'Arle? Can, uh, can we develop new textiles uh, from Alger? After the plastic industry, the textile industry is the most polluting uh, industry. So how can we rethink fashion and the fashion system? Uh, this is uh, sunflower. Maybe that's a... Uh, yeah, I think... It's the last, the last stage of the sunflower before... <laughs> before we use it yeah. for what exactly yeah the um what is nice is that uh, the the site itself will be um climatized uh, by mainly solar energy yeah. but a small part probably from the year we need uh biofuel and we're going to use sunflower oil uh, but to be very precise in it and also to make sure that we are not just cutting the sunflower that we can reuse everything that is uh, left over uh, and then maybe we can uh, make um, materials like a kind of styrofoam but then 100% uh, 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 sunflower and what you see here could be like a, a sounding board, could be an acoustic panel, could be packaging material in itself. Um, we are studying all kinds of materials. We are in the delta of the, of the Rhone, uh, so the wetland is uh, very present. Nevertheless, nothing is done with clay in the region. Very strange. Uh, historically, though, it is. Looking to materials, but also like the plants that are in the Parc National and are quite invasive and aggressive and killing a, a, the biodiversity. How do you deal with that? How can we make something new out of it? Uh, and then salt, uh, as an abundant material, one of the material that is abundant in uh, uh, the world, uh, but is almost not used because we have a kind of negative connotation on it. Uh, and um, yeah, 
you won't see anything, uh, and that's maybe also good because you will see it in the new building in a, a very interesting. Yeah, we have to hurry. Yeah, <laughs> in a, every to make it a very spec spectacular uh, installation. So that's more or less Atelier Luma, uh, one of the elements of the Archipelago, because yeah. uh, Luma Foundation is much more than that, and. Uh, well, this is one of the most important uh, um, islands of the archipelago, so to say. Thank you for that. So that's, uh, that's thanks to you. Um, I would like maybe, uh, I went through the projects very fast, but maybe there are, there's like a, a couple of uh, minutes uh, to hear somebody from the public. Later on, we will go further in deep uh, in detail with about the algae. And then uh, we talk with uh, John Tekera about the text he wrote uh, for the book, uh, the publication that is here outside today. But uh, happy to hear more questions, which is for us very evident uh, and very, yeah, John, hi. Um, I mean, uh, I guess I'm wondering, so one part of the, of changing the material basis of the lives we lead is the actual materials research, which is most of what you've shown, right? I'm just curious um, what kinds of thinking are happening on the kind of uh, the industrialization and that is to say like the ma ma maybe mass customization or mass production, like how, how are you rethinking how these new materials are put into production yeah. processes? Yeah, that's uh, um, uh, a yeah, very super super good question and an essential question where we every day like we question uh, how do we tackle this problem because um, one of the issues of uh, uh, what we produce today is that uh, we go to monoculture we produce everywhere around the world uh, the same thing to l look to the Amazon for instance everywhere is soy or if you look to Chile there is avocado or Indonesia there you have palm oil so all these kind of very radical so-called solutions suddenly become a huge problem so how can we tackle it uh, and at the same time um, uh, grow to a sustainable world with uh, more or less uh, kind of um, uh, um, uh, taking in account locality therefore what we are doing is developing the Luma formula, we call it, and that's more explained in the book. It's an approach where we, we see this as a, a methodology to reconnect uh, all kind of material resources and immaterial resources in a, in a region to build and to, um, a kind of biotope uh, where new things can be produced. So you could imagine that um, Maybe, uh, and that's what we're trying to experiment, the algae, for instance. We went to Istanbul, we went to Egypt. Uh, we are working and looking to uh, Sardinia. Uh, but rather than exporting materials, uh, we will produce material in Arle, for Arle, and for uh, the community there. But maybe we can also uh, learn from other communities, uh, around, for instance, at this moment, around the Mediterranean. Um, and also create their local economy to maintain um, uh, um, yeah, wetlands, for instance. Especially that is where we are focusing on in this moment. Yeah. So it's more about a model to deal with uh, soil, earth, nature, than trying to export. And nevertheless, we are really working on industrial applications. We can, uh, with the, the algae for instance, uh, we are really producing on an industrial scale, uh, but we will, we need to, to balance that and we will also look for maybe other models there. Hi. And yes. Hi, um, I'm interested to know what have been the um, the effect that the Luma Arl has had in the local, uh, so on the local scene. So, have other kind of similar realities have developed? Have people taken? Have the local people taken advantage of what you're doing? What? How is it moving? How is it changing? Well, right now, as I said, we are still in the development phases and in the study phase. 
Yes, we have feedback and we have uh, people who come with ideas and with things, but the, 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 the feedback into the society has not, not uh, taken place yet, yet, um, yet in, in terms of, uh, of material, mat material, yeah, materiality. But the discussions is what, what brings you further. Yeah, so every project uh, is, uh, each time, if we do a project, if it is the algae or it's with salt, uh, it's with somebody. So, and it's indeed on the research level, but we built uh, and reconnect and built uh, little networks each time around the project. So that is, and that can be a farmer, like the sunflower, that's really the farmer, and Caroline is uh, sitting next to you. I remember a moment where like a, a table of 10 uh, um, uh, people that I didn't know where they were coming from, uh, like a, a farmer, uh, somebody who was dealing with uh, oil, somebody who was dealing with waste, uh, all from the region were just brainstorming and they were all experts uh, in, in their field, but they never met and they never came together. So it's our goal to bring all these people together and to build um, like corporations, uh, cooperative maybe. It depends a bit on the projects around it. Uh, um, and that's what we are doing. I think the RISE project... But don't forget that we are not coming from the stratosphere. We were, we were there for all these years, like I tried to say in the beginning. There is a network so already. So we, we yeah. already have this network and we can actually build out of it, right? So there is, or that's also, you feel that the network around the organic uh, garden, the restaurant, the people that are coming there, the, that are inspired by that, is like, that looks like um, uh, there is already history. Uh, it's uh, fragile uh, because it's not yet an eco economical um, endeavor or enterprise, but people see and believe that there is a possibility. And because there has always been a battle between the conventional, in terms of agriculture, for instance, between the, the conventional approach and the, more, and the more organic approach. So this is not solved by, but we can bring a little, a little uh, stone to the, to the building. Yeah, the, some of the ideas is like, how can we, if, a waste and agriculture waste is a cost. How can we turn it into uh, an, uh, an income? And uh, if farmers uh, have an extra income uh, rather than an extra cost, how can we then um, build uh, a cooperative with them and also sign maybe a charter uh, for uh, doing uh, healthy and organic um, agriculture? Uh, that's where we are aiming for. We are not yet there, but the, the stepping stones are on the way. We did a lot since we started. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Merci. Merci. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Um. There is a, a short shift. Uh, we go to the Algae Lab and uh, Maartje uh, Dross and Erik Klarenbeek of Studio Klarenbeek, Johanna Wegelaar, uh, the Algae Lab uh, project manager, um, myself. John, you can join. No? Yeah, we just jump and we go. But Jan, you're leaving the stage? <laughs> oh, okay. So that's our part. Yeah, okay. Thank you, <laughs> Mart.
Shall we start? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, well, you were all uh, warmed up by the first uh, session. Um, so we, we will uh, build on what has been said about uh, Atelier Ma by uh, focusing on one of the projects of the Atelier, which is the uh, Algae Platform, Algae Lab Algae Platform. We'll uh, show how this uh, uh, appeared and uh, was developed. Um, so I'm just for the presentation, I'm um, leading the project at Atelier Luma, and we are very happy to have Eric and Marta here uh, who uh, contributed to really start the project with us and to develop it. And uh, so we spend a lot of time together uh, in Arles, so we are happy to meet you uh, again here in Basel. And uh, John Takara, who uh, actually was on board uh, with Atelier Luma since the beginning as a kind of uh, critical eye on, the, on what we do and an advisor, maybe. Um, and the, um, before we start um, speaking about the, the construction of the project, I want to show the, uh, this map uh, because um, we mentioned that the project really started in Arles, but uh, this one especially has a Mediterranean uh, focus or ambition, I would say. This might trigger a bit your imagination because it's a map of the Mediterranean. Uh, you might not be totally used to it. It's um, uh, switched uh, vertical uh, and Al is on the top. I don't have a laser, but uh, you might see the delta of the Camargue on the, on the top. If you recognize uh, Sardinia, Italy, you might find your way to Arles. And we like it because it's, it's uh, it shows water, uh, water as a resource and as a, as a connector, actually. So not the Mediterranean as a, as a border, but as really a, a field of connection between lands. And that's a part of the ambition of the algae platform, to, to use algae, the water, as a connector uh, means to other uh, locations and communities. So let's... Just describe a bit how we uh, started all that. Um, maybe tell us how you, you came to Arles, who, uh, what was your first uh, steps in Arles, and who, uh, who invited you? I have a suspect there, but... Uh. Yeah. <laughs> um, Arles, yeah. um, or before? <clears throat> no. um, we, uh, we were working... Um, in our studio uh, for a longer period uh, with uh, bio-based materials um, coming from uh, working with mushroom materials um, but also uh, we had a link with the North Sea farmers in Holland. Uh, they were thinking about how to reclaim uh, water also uh, in production uh, for productional uses for nutrition but also for materials and um, uh, in our studio, we uh, were testing and, and experimenting with uh, 3D printing based on bio-based materials and um, started with um, filaments, just the printing wire um, from uh, algae. And um, then uh, another, uh, well, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> I didn't know that, eh? At Maybe? that moment, at that moment, I was not aware of when we invited you. Yeah. I thought we were going to do something with uh, <coughs> biomaterial and then um, and mushrooms. Yeah, yes. yeah, mushrooms, yeah. 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 yeah, but then we, got, we were aware of this kind of shift, that we are in this kind of shift from agriculture towards secriculture, so that um, these kind of mo movements in how we perceive our land, how we use our land, how the pressure on food, um, uh, that it's very relevant that we use land also for food production and for humans, and that we can use uh, the oceans as a kind of new source to, um, to create biomatter and simultaneously bind carbon, so, um, which can bind in algae, and uh, yeah. That was something we picked up with, with Wageningen. We started cultivating seaweeds in the city of Amsterdam, trying to, uh, to cultivate it, but um, then we, we shifted more towards the biopolymers itself and yeah. uh, the recipes. And then um, we came in Arle. 
Yeah, but another background is I think that I'm half French. So one of the ideas or exper other experiments was how would it be to work in France and to uh, can we can we link to that community and um, what does it say about our backgrounds or cultural history? What can we learn from that? So when we were invited to take a look in Arles, um, a lot of things for us came together as well. It is also not a coincidence that we invited quite a lot of Dutch designers, not because uh, I'm and also Henri Etoile who started uh, together with me the, the project, but the landscape of the Camargue uh, is also an engineered landscape that is mm. very similar uh, to the Dutch uh, landscape. Mm -hmm. So all the elements that you can find in the uh, Dutch, uh, let's say, not really wetlands, but uh, the yeah. polders, uh, are also um, have a relation with uh, the Camargue. Yeah. So, a word about this landscape. You see it a bit on the on the screen. It's mainly flat, very flat. A lot of water, right? A lot of ponds, uh, rivers, canals, mm -hmm. and a very rich biodiversity, uh, which is really the the characteristic of these wetlands and algae. Yeah. yeah. So what? Well, maybe for people, what are the algae? Because I, I know people have a very sometimes vague association with uh, algae. Yeah. yeah, so you have like the main groups, um, like the macro algae, which we see as, uh, or which we name seaweed. So they grow in strings, or we have the, the, the stuff that colors the water green, and that's the micro algae. So um, that you can find everywhere on this planet. There are a lot of common species, but then we went to this Camargue, and then you have, uh, instead of that, like this, uh, this birds you have in the Netherlands, there are suddenly flamingos, and uh, you have this kind of pink water. And this pink water is also the pink that colors the flamingo pink. And that's, for instance, one of the components which we can use as a biomaterial, because it's a plasticizer, one of the main components of a plastic, or a bioplastic biopolymer, and simultaneously an interesting pigment. So that's are one of uh, a few of these, uh, these algae. And why are algae interesting? Because uh, algae produce the majority of the oxygen we breathe in. So humanity is dependent on algae, and therefore uh, it's interesting to cultivate more algae in order to bind more CO2 and produce more oxygen. And what we also see in Arle is that uh, we found there um, a lot of spirulina farmers. Eh? That, um, so as a nutrition, it's quite uh, yeah. well known. And uh, in Arle, for a, uh, the south of France, for a good quality of spirulina. But um, we also thought it and, and learned in, in the Netherlands that farmers and farming and, and, have, and being able to do a production in a sort of species is very helpful to create a new network and in combination uh, to attract to, to this network if you um, want to experiment with new materials. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's very interesting in the, in the region where we're uh, working now because there is this existing network yeah, of farmers, uh, especially yes. cultivating the spirulina for food. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, there are all these species present in the Camargue, uh, which we, we found out uh, quite quickly that this was still very unknown, and, and we turned out to Tour du Valais, which is the um, uh, expert in uh, the biology and the ecosystem of the, uh, of the Camargue, and they actually don't know that much about algae. So that was also a very interesting moment, I think, in the yeah. project. In, in Holland, we were talking about uh, macroalgae, so it was all there, and it was very visible, and there were, uh, it was very determined which kind of species we, uh, we can grow and what kind of... Um, um, uh, ingredients we can use uh, with that, but in Arla, what you say, it, it then it, it really came uh, was clear that we actually don't know so much about this algae world, and that there's so much to discover. So um, that made it very interesting to also link production to uh, research and say, okay, um, we really have to not only think of new economies and new values and new. Um, economical systems, but at the same time we can Im use that or take the, uh, the profits from that and do, uh, put it in ongoing research uh, and finding new, uh, learn, to learn the new values uh, of, of this area. So these uh, visits then led to the proposal of the LG Lab, 
um, and that 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 was the idea to set up. Um, so we set up the lab physically. So the lab consists of uh, cultivation, um, extraction, and then processing into biopolymers, and then afterwards convert it into an object. We we have photos same, coming on that. Uh, algae. Yeah. Yeah. So here you see uh, harvesting. Um, I think so it's important to say, yeah, we physically, so you went, we went, we have a biologist now in the lab who yes. also still goes every, uh, I don't know, uh, two weeks uh, on the field, takes samples of uh, seaweed like this, uh, but also just water where there are uh, different species of uh, microalgae mm -hmm. and try to identify it and grow it in the lab, right? Exactly, and that's very relevant because um, if you want to uh, appreciate nature, you have to work with the local biologists, you have to work with the local organisms, you have to understand these organisms. So it was therefore very vital um, to build not only physically the lab, but also to build a team out of these scientists, biologists and institutes which were in these, uh, uh, present in this, uh, this area. So that was for us also a learning experience because there were uh, institutes such as the, the Nuclear Institute, say, uh, uh, who were studying uh, algae since like the oil crisis. They had already a lab. They they had biofuel out of algae, which was almost viable, but due to the low oil prices, they're still waiting till the moment until uh, it comes. And now you see that there is the momentum is coming closer. So these kind of institutes, universities who are uh, working with also algae, uh, farmers, as it's already an existing uh, economy in the region, which was also uh, extremely interesting to, uh, to learn and to work uh, with these uh, partners and uh, set up a, corp uh, yeah, a network of these, uh, these people where, where you can also appreciate local ecology, um, study by every week taking samples from the region, uh, looking to the, the properties of these specific algae. So um, how valuable they are for a biopolymer, but also how quick they grow, for instance. So that was the whole study of um, going every week in the field and working with a local biologist and the ecology. So in terms of uh, network, yeah, we, we uh, could uh, set up quite uh, yeah, some interesting partnerships uh, with the engineering school, uh, CERA, um, experts, startups, etc. So uh, in what we and develop what Jan, you often call the ecosystem of partners, so which you consider, I think, as something uh, living or um, organically developing or something. So how you, you're really uh, somebody of network also and, uh, and seeing the value of this, uh, of growing these uh, partnerships. Well, uh, it's very clear that um, uh, coming in with uh, a design lens is uh, is one thing, but um, um, also the mission that we were given by Maya is to to collaborate uh, was really fitting with uh, with my vision of uh, um, that you can in fact uh, you can never do something alone. You always have to um, uh, um, bring people around you that um, have a complementary uh, knowledge, uh, that know something you don't know, that can something you can't do. And by doing that uh, and creating a diverse group of people around you uh, and connect them, uh, you create like a, a strong and resilient ecosystem. The, the problem of contemporary society is that everything is so specialized mm -hmm. um, and everybody is in his uh, or her, um, uh, let's say, um, departments and niches and, and also designers also sometimes, like we are now here in Design Miami talking to ourselves again. Um, hopefully broadcasted. Nevertheless, um, uh, uh, we have to start somewhere. Uh, so by building these bridges, by building these connections, suddenly uh, all, uh, all kind of things uh, start to accelerate, uh, things we didn't expect. Um, and this is something I cherish. Uh, and I also, in fact, um, learned from one of the first meetings I had with uh, John Tekera. Uh, where he really um, 
uh, enforced also like it's so not always like uh, building connections with institutes we are talking a lot about uh, but where he said you have to connect with other people it's about the people in the institutes in the organizations mm -hmm. that want to put energy in these kind of projects yeah. I I, must, I think that it also was very daring and good that every yeah, that the doors were open to uh, laboratory uh, workshops uh, together with uh, the constant uh, stream of uh, the first tourists that came to Arle to see it, uh, to bring in students at the same time. We really had to live there as well in the middle of the city being confronted, confronted uh, being there with the community, with the 3D printer, the local 3D printer, getting to know him, drinking a, drinking a wine, uh, and going to events together. But um, we really felt that it took not one meeting, not two meetings, not uh, just an appointment, but really to try to create a bond and get to understand each other's expertise in a way by just being together in the same space. Yeah, yeah and I, I think there are those moments where we see, oh, we, we managed to put two different per person uh, who wouldn't have uh, yeah, been in contact otherwise and uh, seeing like our biology speaking with the engineer in the, in the atelier, like those moments where you think, oh, well, we, we achieved something there and uh, this, <laughs> oops, what will happen now? <laughs> and um, this connection, yeah. And but just to, to, um, to quote you in, in the book, there, there is a passage where you say, yeah, it needs to be messy. And I think this relates to this ecosystem uh, uh, idea uh, and uh, with the... Uh, with the ambition not to have a, a pre-established goal, but a, a kind of messy, productive um, uh, atmosphere to, to work in, so... Yeah, it is, um, like I said in the beginning, the invitation of... Uh, and that's the also, of course, the chance and the opportunity that we get from uh, Maya, and um, the fact that um, there is not um, a kind of clear goal has to come out so the um, we have the chance to work in an environment where um, we can fundamentally rethink um, efficiency what that means and if you have that chance it's like uh, that means that the output uh, is not completely um, figured out or described already like in traditional applied research, uh, people know what they are looking for. Here we had the chance to work in a, in a situation where that um, we had an open space, we knew a field, we could bring people in, and we could discover uh, in this ambiguous, um, uh, uncertain, uh, diverse uh, environment, we could set up collaborations, and that creates like a, um, much stronger, uh, let's say, innovations, if you want to use that uh, buzzword, like innovations um, that uh, were unpredictable, were not yet, um, I, we, we are still opening boxes of Pandora, I say often, uh, when we are in the atelier. So each time we come up with a new kind of um, uh, findings. Uh, it's not that um, uh, what we are doing is so, um, uh, um, and that's uh, so new or rocket science. It's really like almost like evident what we we just bump in and we find it and we take it uh, and we take it seriously. So it's this this kind of randomness uh, rather than uh, a trajectory that is completely planned. Maybe, John, a uh, nice moment for you to react on that. Did you feel, uh, as an external um, eye on the, uh, on the atelier, do, do you feel this messiness of the atelier and how it's um, productive in its uh, way? Yeah, I mean, a number of very um, striking experiences all have one thing in common, which is that people are looking at their place with fresh eyes but doing it in a collaborative way. I think two years ago, there was this fabulous uh, meal prepared with plants from the region. Um, and there was a moment when uh, the project leader, uh, who is a designer and a kind of social food curator, uh, three women from the local community of diverse cultural backgrounds, 
and an ecologist from the Camargue, who's associated with the university, those four women were basically very proud of having contributed different things to this extraordinary meal, namely the scientists understanding which, uh, you know, which plants and flowers are edible, uh, the women coming from different backgrounds finding new ways to cook it, and the social food organizer, curator, saying how can we work together in a good way. And yes, that's open-ended, but it's all uh, inspired and the richness comes from the qualities of the place. And I personally don't think it'll tell you Loomis about finding new materials. I mean, it does, but it's not like a lab for replacing plastic with algae. It's, I think it's more profound than that. It's about how can designers and all sorts of other people see new qualities in their place that were missed before. I mean, I, there was a lovely picture on a bit earlier of the Camargue. I mean, my, I was 20 years ago, I was in Gujarat in India, which is another salt sort of place. And I remember thinking, oh my God, there's a, like, it's a salt to the horizon, there's nothing here. And I was taken on a learning journey of several days by you know, somebody who helped me to see unbelievable variety of life in that apparently empty place. And so to me, that's what the Camargue and Atelier Luma are about, is just being more respectful of things that we don't know yet. Mm. So yes, open, but finding values that uh, are not apparent when you first look. Mm. And, um, well, we, just to jump back from the bigger to the, to the concrete picture, that's a, a kind of a candy uh, shop that we set up in the atelier with different type of algae where we, at the, at the beginning, have no idea what kind of value is in it in, in this case. And it's, it's either identified algae or water, um, like a blurry water. I, I, where a, we, I have a question on this because I've been following this from, since I first met you guys three years ago, yes. and my question is how far you've got beyond the notion that it has to be that it, towards a, a regional platform for making things. Because I think one of the things, somebody over here said, you know, is it industrially scaled at this moment? Mm -hmm. And I think that, again, what's the potential here is to move beyond the notion of industrial scale as a desirable outcome. Mm. Why can't we have a bioregional scale production of stuff, yes. including, you know, containers, coffee cups, and take away yeah. food things, which are produced within the region, 100% biodegradable. Yeah. And I think they should be produced as a server. I don't even see why they have to be a commercial business. Maybe the regional should just give everybody biodegradable mm. cups and then guaranteeing zero waste situation. Mm. How's it going on that yeah. front? Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's the basis. And um, that's actually also what I like about your writing, about your work, huh? as a thrive in the next economy. I always wonder, or we always wonder from how could we move forward? And, um, and therefore, we strongly believe in this kind of uh, small production facilities, such as uh, robotics, 3D printers, that can create these, uh, these objects, uh, the automation of these uh, printers. So therefore, it's spitted out every 20 minutes a new cup. <laughs> and, and that's still something we, uh, we want to implement. Yeah, that, with, that we have the local implementation. We only struggle with a few practical issues, such as uh, food safety. Although it sounds very boring, um, if you want to drink from the cup, we drank from the cup also with the banquet, huh? um, and there it becomes used, and that I find also very valuable. And I also want to say about this vanille, these uh, records we developed with uh, Reef Schumacher, so we had music from LG records on the background while drinking from LG cups, and then you feel it's taken over your whole world. It becomes a kind of new, uh, new reality. Um, but then, yeah, still we have to take responsibility. Um, we have to go through these kind of certification, and uh, scaling makes it also maybe then more difficult. If you would do it in an informal setting, it would be much easier. Yeah, because I, I was in a meeting last week with some people who. We're trying to get, I don't know, 50 million euros for a new cultural center. And they were having, you know, endless meetings and five years of discussions and post PowerPoints and the whole works. And I say, well, for one tenth of that amount, or maybe even 1%, you could have a lab of people doing things in your region, which every day would create new ideas. Yeah. But the trouble is that the kind of the innovation system is predicated on if it's not big and expensive, it's not going to create something interesting. Yeah. And that's what's so great about this is that. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's big buildings being built, but the real value is when you get out of the 
buildings and talk to people and meet scientists and meet farmers and stuff. Am, am I right? Mm. So, yeah. Fully. <laughs> well, we see that all these kind of uh, lab equipment and ways to uh, look on a microscopical level or extract certain uh, uh, ingredients from, from an algae, uh, that, these, that these machines and this machinery becomes more affordable, um, but not all of them yet. That's <laughs> No, but I don't know how many we of have you, some missing links you have there. to read this book because it's a fabulous, it's not your project, the invasive plants, but to me it's like the Camargue is the big picture mm -hmm. and the small is the project called what do you do with invasive plants? Well, one thing you do is to change the word invasive to, to raw material. You have lots of raw material yeah. that we're not using and who's great at coming up with, you know, designers and uh, yeah. engineers and scientists can come up with things that an, an ecologist would not come up with. Mm -hmm. And without doing anything at all, you suddenly create a fantastic yeah. opportunity. Yeah, yeah the, the vocabulary is certainly a, a, a huge thing. Eh? Also, how that we talk about algae, the bioplastics or the biopolymers or the invasive species of the species that are there and are growing rapidly. Uh, so they all have a kind of uh, political connotation. Also, the whole notion of uh, local production is not neutral. Uh, it's not neutral at all. It seems like very uh, strong. It is also uh, used and abused a lot uh, by uh, different uh, political parties. So it's not an easy way to see a landscape as a, a local landscape and then um, starting uh, to go beyond also where uh, Maya was referring to, to not only conserving but uh, as a productive and a dynamic uh, landscape that is continuously in uh, in flux and in flow and changing. The algae is also not a neutral uh, plant or uh, blooming. Um, the, al the blooming algae, for instance, what we uh, were discovering in Istanbul is that uh, every year, the last years, uh, it's blooming, turquoise, because suddenly, due to pollution, it's there. And it's uh, abundant there. It's not just there and uh, it creates like issues. Also in the south of France there are quite a lot of uh, uh, very polluted areas where suddenly uh, the amount of algae is getting uh, so high due to pollution in itself. Yeah. So what we are doing uh, is all uh, questioning this, um, uh, this um, let's say, uh, landscape um, that is out of balance, that is getting out of balance, that is continuously challenged. Uh, how can we uh, live with that uh, rather than to fight against it, to maintain it? Um, the, the, the most interesting discussion I had at Luma Days this year was on this exact subject of how do we move beyond blaming farmers for poisoning the water. So it's phosphates from farming that causes the algae blooms to happen. So you say, you bad farmer, you must stop using this phosphate, despite the fact they've been told to use it for 30 or 40 years yep. and be economic incentives. If you're going to ask farmers to stop using phosphates, they, have, they will need other, other forms of livelihood. So they can be part of the conversation about if you're going to use your land in a different way than mass production of monocrops, yep. then who is going to kind of help you come up with new ways to use your land? Answer all these experiments that we've seen. Maybe it's algae, maybe it's materials, maybe it's food, maybe it's energy. And I would like to say that there is no one uh, answer with algae because uh, there, there are first multiple algae. Yeah? We're, we're mapping the territory with, uh, with the different species we find. So uh, we, we have more than 30 or 40 at the moment. Uh, they're coming from natural sites, also from polluted sites uh, due to rising water. There, there we will also have more algae blooms. So there, algae is not one thing with one context and one uh, phenomenon. It's, it's, it's a m multiple uh, uh, situations occurring due to multiple situations and, and yeah, allowing multiple uh, um, treatment and processing of the, of the resource, yeah. yeah. And, uh, sorry? Can yeah. I interrupt? No, <laughs> go ahead. And then I would like to go back on the, on the, on. On the curve. Go on. Okay. <laughs> Just, uh, I, I would like you to say a word on the, on, uh, act, the actual objects that you um, uh, developed. So we have a couple here. Yes. And uh, yeah. what are they? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, so um, it derives from the algae, and that's what, what I wanted to say. Sorry, I cannot uh, <laughs> resist. 
<laughs> but um, about this kind of scale, there needs to be a kind of scale um, because in order to get to this cup, now it takes us uh, several weeks to get one uh, cup, for instance, or a kilo. And then the cup becomes very expensive and then it's hard to implement in a kind of local economy. So therefore you have to, to build uh, all the steps and the whole infrastructure from the beginning to the end. And then how does that happen? Would you like to tell about it? Sorry, I was giving, I was giving away cups. <laughs> yeah, would you like to know more about um, the material I, or no, the I form? No, I think in the, in the um, uh, reflection about local, so yeah. uh, we might criticize it, but uh, how, how do we produce local? It's not only about uh, local materials, it's about mm -hmm. also the, the local culture to, and, to and yeah, find a way to reflect uh, the, this culture. I think in, in this uh, first collection we disenclosed the, the, the cultural history of Arle by really um, by 3D scanning the existing objects that were found in the Rhone uh, but are now in depot uh, or um, showed, uh, showcased in the, in the museum. Uh, behind vitrines. Behind <laughs> vitrines. So um, I think it was also a poetical gesture to say, okay, uh, this cultural heritage and that what we can find uh, that that enriches our our uh, society and uh, is in our common uh, um, uh, common uh, uh, historical Imaginary. yeah uh, historical memory. Um, we will reuse. We will bring back uh, to to us uh, and share and and um, make a discussion piece and use again and see what what that. Uh, Brings us. So there are, uh, for example, uh, replicas of uh, the uh, yeah. small uh, perfume bottles and, uh, and uh, vases that are found in the yeah. in the museum of uh, Arles. Yeah. Yes. Found in the river and then reproduced with organisms out of the same delta. Why, why yeah. did you want it? Uh, maybe it's also good. Why? Why? Because it's exactly what uh, John is saying. We are. It's not about uh, material research, and then suddenly. We, you come up with uh, objects. Uh, yes. Why was that done? What, why uh, did yeah. you want to come up with objects? We, we always feel the urge to be concrete in the end if we want to explore something because that's the way to bring it in society, to bring it to the public, to bring it... Uh, huh? Then it speaks. ...in the discussion. And, yeah. and there you also see that still a lot of uh, fossil oil-based plastics are used. Uh, disposables in uh, restaurants, in cafes, on the market. Uh, you see that people are searching for a kind of new structures. So you had this kind of uh, borrowing cups, yeah. uh, but then still out of a fossil. But, uh, so I, I'm, I, if you go to any religion or faith in the world, has yes. vessels at the heart of its rituals, you know, yeah. the containing of value or water or something precious. Mm -hmm. So to me, the, the question is, do we, is it necessarily a success I mean, do you, is it only a success if you make mass production through this process, or maybe you get people to rethink the value of a vessel or a cup yes. yeah. because of rituals and all sorts of other stuff, mm -hmm. so you don't need to produce millions of them. Maybe no. everybody in the Camargue would have one, yes. and then you kind of, that's a success. I think that was so also the, the scale of Luma and the city of Arles is perfect, was a perfect playground or testing ground eh, to, do, to do that and to create that. Uh, the museum has events that I think vary from 300 to 1,000 uh, participants. Uh, and that is a really uh, a nice um, yeah, scale to work also with 3D printing and also make it local and unique and create this identity. Uh, so we see, yeah, the banquet we were mentioning just yeah. before, and uh, which is also this, uh, like the small scale, uh, yeah. I don't know, 50, uh, 100 participants to the banquets and, uh, and with uh, products from the region that we're eating, but also that uh, help, uh, yeah, making those vessels to eat, drink, etc. Yeah. So mm -hmm. challenging also our uh, eating habits and our uh, habits in, uh, in all ways, yeah. And we printed all these uh, objects, so these 100, 130, I think, over a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> so that shows also the power of these, uh, of these machines. That you can really have decentralized fabrication on a local level, out of local resources. But we still have to build the infrastructure, because sometimes the, the, then it's too simplistic. 
to think about the printing only because then you didn't, don't take into account where or how the material is derived. So then I cannot get back, I'm sorry, on the material <laughs> because it has to come from somewhere. I, I think there's a big uh, opportunity to find a way to tell the story of 3D printing, the technology, the biology, the training, the skills as a form of infrastructure because yeah. every government is desperate to have a green new deal and they mm. think they're going to build, I don't know what they're going to build, the roads or dams or you know, wind farms, but if you could find a way for them to understand that this infrastructure of things and people and skills is also a preparation for the future, then there will be resources, I'm sure of that. Okay. It's just a question of reframing the mm. story so they can understand it. Yeah, and I think also by implementing the AI and the, de the data, the, da the collecting of data that we, that we do everywhere, uh, we, ju we don't have uh, the translation towards the object, but um, I think that is one of the interests and we see it as a next step that it will be much more um, able to, to morph each time and to adjust itself to the program or to the, to the uh, demands of... of um, I, I want to come uh, back to that question of the infrastructure uh, because um, I don't succeed... Uh, I'm going to share my um, doubts uh, that I have about Atelier Luma with uh, the public and maybe also somebody else can jump in, in, the, in the discussion. I don't succeed in describing uh, or give one word or uh, what Atelier Luma is, uh, what kind of infrastructure it is. Sometimes I use the word it's a research lab, uh, then it's uh, a place where designers work, then it is a, a meeting point, then it's a, a fab lab, which is it absolutely not. Uh, so what is it? Um, what, you, you, how would you... You and uh, I have had this discussion a couple of times, and I'm sub I am a words expert, I have no other yeah. skill. I would just stop trying to look for a, de a definition or a description. Yeah. I would just say to anybody, look, it's, it's, it's hard to explain, will you give me half a day of your time and come and see? Yeah. So that's when I got excited, because mm -hmm. anybody can write words or make PowerPoint presentations, but when exactly. you go and see yeah. his lab, the uh, sunflower seed oils turn into a kind of composite material, mm -hmm. the rice straw turn into something, and when the people who are involved in the making say, well, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with this stuff, but it's cool, think, great, because then everybody coming and say, well, I need something for my insulation, I need something, I, I'm the, the guy from BMW wants to fill up BMW mm -hmm. uh, with uh, mycelium insulation, I'm not 100% sure that's on message, but you know, the point <laughs> is that you, people can come and make their own, join a, their own dots up. So mm -hmm. don't panic about coming up with a perfect definition, you'll okay. never get cool. there. Just show the, show cool. the work. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you have one answer, Jan. Yes, yes. <laughs> Finally. I can sleep again. No, no, I can. Yeah. I always send people to sleep. That's my special. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we won the new Matchwall Award this, uh, this year. That was also worth uh, mentioning the, uh, this time. So in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands, right? This uh, competition in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, great um, uh, reward of the, of the project. Yeah. I don't know if you want to say a word of that, or there was a... No, I, think, I think for us it was very valuable, because yeah. um, there's happening more on the <coughs> LG, yeah? even like the, the biggest polluters on the planet <laughs> are promoting biofuels out of LG, although this technology exists, yeah? what I stated previously. So I think people hear about it, but I think it's also very relevant that we, uh, that we start embracing these microorganisms in order to come to a kind of new way of, uh, um, of fabrication, new way of living, new, way of, uh, new social context. Um, and therefore, as there are many initiatives or more several initiatives uh, happening, uh, we were very yeah, happy and proud that we uh, got this, uh, mm. this award. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I really think it helps uh, promoting uh, the algae, which is, yeah, I said, uh, people have a very vague idea mostly about what it is, and it's often seen as a, as a threat, like with these uh, algae blooms, like in France, in Bretagne, for example, uh, occurring every year, uh, and, and like this massive ulva bloom, or as a kind of uh, promise of the future, the, 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 the miracle uh, solution for, the, for all the climate crisis. And, 
and there are also more, much more nuanced uh, relationships that we have to uh, research, I think, and to develop. Um, uh, also seeing all the potential of algae, so not only materials, but food, pharmaceutical uh, uh, uses, pigments, which can be uh, applied in many, many different ways. So it's a multifunctional uh, entity. Yes. No, I just think this is, I think this is a social quality as well. Yeah. That, uh, there's lots of people looking for materials. BMW want insulation, the building industry wants materials, but there's, I would say, more people in the policy world and government and you know, society generally want ways for people to start talking together rather than fighting each other. And I think that algae is, you know, and natural materials are a brilliant way for people to begin to talk to each other in a place. Have you heard of the, there's a Norwegian artist called Eva Bakkeslet? who talks about social fermentation. I just learned about this last week. So anybody who deals with bread or beer or living things yeah. and you're making stuff, you're kind of the bun, your, your microbes and the microbes in the beer and the microbes in the bread all kind of mix up together. Yeah. And have you ever met an unhappy bread person? This is my test. Has anybody, or an unhappy brewer? No. They're all happy because they're mixed up with the microbes and the you know, stuff. And, all that. and I think that social fermentation, I don't know how you can sell it, but it's what people are looking so for. So it's a place for social fermentation. Yeah. <laughs> we found it. We found this the words. I want to yeah, make sure that we credit Eva for this because yeah, she's yeah. A, a very wonderful artist yeah. who works on brewing as a means of social connection. Yeah. But um, uh, I uh, question always these kind of awards. Eh? It's nice to get. It's really good and uh, it's nice. But uh, there is like um, uh, around the, uh, the algae, there is also like a as if there is a promise that we can save the world um, mm. and that we will replace uh, plastics with it and so on. No, it's fundamentally something different. It's a, it's a biopolymer. It is uh, certainly uh, addressing some things uh, as an object and it's also a possible um, uh, replacer of some of the applications of, uh, uh, of what we are uh, what we are using sometimes plastic for, but uh, yeah. I think what we see a lot is that we use only the very high and technical plastics, and we use it for everything because it's uh, uh, durable. Uh, it's uh, you can trust upon it, but. Um, uh, also in Luma, when we talked with the farmers, but also in the Netherlands, when we talk with farmers, they have and and the produce they're making, they use a lot of plastics. Um, while we see that this algae, if we can extract a nutrient, we can extract uh, um, uh, an insecticide, a natural insecticide. Uh, I just heard that we search for an insect, it is existing, and then what's left over is a fiber that you can actually put in a biopolymer, so what they use as plastic objects can be biodegradable. So I think the diversity of the, of the pro product, plastic, um, is addressed by coming with uh, other rece uh, recepts for bioplastics as well. Yeah, but I, I think it's also the quest of searching for a fully circular system and a social circular system which is uh, in balance with our environment and that's what's something we got lost on the way. So I, um, I hope we were much more cautious and much more uh, uh, aware of the, the materials uh, we use around us and that I think that accounts not only for design but also for the fashion industry, for uh, construction. And there okay. you see it's, it's rising, the discussion is rising. Well I have friends who've been probably 25 years with me struggling. Fashion is a good example of where if you concentrate on trying to find good materials to replace bad ones, you never get there because the thing is always ex expanding and growing. And uh, there's a group in England uh, more or less decided that trying to work with big brands to make them at their processes circular was, is just never going to get there because they grow all the time. The only thing that works is to make fashion and fiber systems smaller mm -hmm. and regional. And that way you don't just say, is it yes or no, sustainable and abstract, but mm -hmm. is the soil from which we grew this fiber healthier this year than it was last year, yes or no? And everybody can then measure the health of the soil where the fiber was mm. grown and take you know, collective responsibility mm -hmm. for it. That's the only kind of fiber system
that can be, quote, sustainable. Everything yeah, else yeah. can be gamed and uh, messed around with. No. That, that is uh, this yeah. healthy notion of healthy is also what, uh, uh, what you address in uh, your book, The Next Economy, mm -hmm. where healthy growth is like a, a leading principle or a guiding principle to all kind of small decisions that everybody can take. You and not just abstracts. I spend, you know, most of my life failing completely to persuade people that growth was a bad thing mm. until I finally met an ecologist who said, well, actually, we do want our ecosystems to be healthier. Mm. So maybe the growth we need is the growth in the health of our ecosystems. Yeah. And by the way, you can measure that with all sorts of modern scientific things and data and drones and the whole, you have all of yeah. that, mm. but you're measuring the health of the soil and the air and the water, not the health of the economy in money terms. And it's, once you, it's, to me, it's so simple. Once you get your head around that, he said, that's a good idea, let's do that. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are now, is waiting for this penny mm. to drop, I think. So it's not about degrowth of growth, it's about healthy growth. It's not about abstractions, it's just saying, we d do you want our place to be healthy or not? Yes or yeah. no? Yes, yeah. of course. Okay, how do we make it healthier? And then with the soil, the air, and the water, we have to all do our bit in our sort of not too far distant region. And then we have to help each other in those things. And then one thing leads to another. There's a thing called the provisioning economy, if you've heard of that, which is where you, you provide basic needs locally, and then mm. exotic stuff maybe comes globally. But mm. if you provide your basic needs, food, fiber, and so on, and energy locally, then the minimum is a healthy region, and then you can decide later on whether you kind of cut yourself off. But mm. no, in general, you will be connected internationally, but yeah. your region is healthy as a place. Yeah, yeah. but uh, what I try to keep as a guiding principle is that materials are heavy and need to be local, and ideas and people are light and should travel. Well, I remember, I love that. It's very, I agree with it 100%. The only small but, problem, but, yeah. ideas are not weightless. Because, I mean, you know and I know that we are yeah. talking about heavy stuff, but there's a lot of people think that if you have lots of internet and sort of, yeah. you know... That it's, it's in all, the cloud. That it's in the cloud, therefore it doesn't weigh anything. But actually the cloud is, like, what, 15% of our total energy use mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And so this, we have to kind of say, well, by the way, light does not mean... In your head might be light, but it does in the internet does not mean light. Yeah, correct. And I, I want to add us on the uh, algae that I I think so. We develop this algae platform uh, with new uh, new um, uh, projects, uh, developing new materials, etc. But it's it's it goes far beyond not only material. And and I think the algae is a good ambassador for this a new way of learning. Um, also because it has a very interesting and profound uh, uh, conceptual uh, component in it. Uh, when, you, when you realize that algae are producing, so estimates varies, but between 60 to 80% of the oxygen on Earth, so the oxygen that we breathe. So the al algae from the water are producing the oxygen on, on, on the atmosphere. The, the same algae are the one that made the, uh, the fossil uh, oil uh, on, on periods of uh, millions, billions of years. So there is a strong connection between air, water, and, and earth uh, through the algae. And looking at it on the, on the microscopic uh, level, uh, trying to understand how it works, and then on the macroscopic to understand what are the dynamics on Earth uh, linked to this uh, very, uh, to this tiny element is very good, I think, uh, exercise to, to yeah, learn how to approach the environment again. No, it's fantastic, because just by something nice and green and slimy in your hand can be a physical connection to something which is otherwise very abstract, like Earth mm -hmm. systems or, you know, metamorphosis or metabol, all these scientific words which turn people off a nice handful of slime, you can say, by the way, that's, you know, in your hand there's more living beings than there are people in the universe, or what, you know, one of these words. And I've done that with children, we've all seen mm. children, and they say, really? And then they say, they take that for granted. And then you, then you remake the gap between ourselves and nature that has been lost in, the, mm. in most education systems. So are we going to build a, uh, are we going towards an algae school or uh, through this project in <laughs> no, a way? But um, uh, you're right, it went from a, a project uh, with Eric and Marche, which was like a, 
almost like a coincidence, a finding, and then starting to work, and they came to live in Arle. That became like a network, that became a lab, uh, not an algae lab only, it's also where you instigated also make it into a living lab. And now uh, the lab is there, it's getting a platform, it's uh, traveled to Egypt, uh, Istanbul, uh, Sardinia, uh, Arle, of course, it's going further, and uh, suddenly, it is also uh, that platform and that network also becomes like, uh, and that's what we want to do next year. And maybe I go a bit too fast now. It's a, uh, we really think that we should organize the first Alge summit of the world, uh, uh, bringing for the first time all the people together that are dealing with Alge. Uh, um, and that can be an anthropologist, that can be a sociologist, that can be a biologist, that can be designers, can be all kind of professions that are dealing with algae uh, in a, because like you indicated in the beginning, almost nobody really knows something about it. It's a very uh, small group of people that have an interest and we would like to spread that. I think it would be fantastic because then we can confront there's BMW again. I have a B in my body. <laughs> Are you can paid by them? Or? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> I, I, I'm not. But that woman, that, uh, as I tell you, the Luma Days, the, who did the Mycelia project, yeah. she was saying that yes. she's been asked by BMW, can you mass produce yeah. this mycelium insulation material from BMW cars? Mm -hmm. And then she said this wonderful thing to me called um, mycelia grow best where they're from. Mm -hmm. So they're not, uh, they're not designed to be a kind of global material to fill up BMWs they are probably best and healthiest for themselves in their place where they come from. So that, if you could put that discussion in this global summit, it would be fantastic. Exactly. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, then we can get away from this notion that it's a, a solution to the problem of mass production, because it's not. Yeah. yeah. We, I think also it's nice to, uh, to connect it to also other parties, so like the, the human aspect, but also maybe the economical aspect, to get back to the, the computer servers eh, who absorb a lot of energy, um, but also simultaneously uh, produce a lot of heat, which is uh, fantastic also for LG crowd. <laughs> and also the CO2, huh, which come along. So, and therefore, I've, I'm also very happy that with uh, the Atelier Luma, um, with the, the LG lab, we're working with the uh, local factories, huh, that we're actually binding the CO2, converting it into to LG. So there you see that it can become really a broader network, huh, where maybe the BMW, the factories, all are part of, maybe more from a holistic uh, approach and not this, what we lack too much in our society, that everybody's too independent on their own, uh, on their own field. There's a, there's a software metaphor, well, analog to this, because I was talking to some people from the open source software world, they're, not, they're now talking about local software. Mm. And so yeah, lo yeah. there's a the lot local. of work being done to make soft, like not big server farms to have every YouTube video on the planet in Iceland, but to spread them around and have but local software as well. Certainly one of the ideas in the beginning of Atelier Numa was uh, the local car uh, um, yes. uh, company, uh, which is uh, really organized like that. So you mm. could Im imagine indeed that platforms are exchanged, but then on top of that you build uh, platforms, uh, cars that are locally manufactured. We had an was just getting a message uh, in between, so I was not really listening. Uh, but there was a message uh, from uh, the, the, our WhatsApp group of the atelier. So we they made like the, the first uh, algae uh, fiber uh, of uh, 0 0.5 millimeter. Uh, so that's Yarn, a big yeah. uh, for us a big yeah. big breakthrough. Uh, we produced it in the atelier itself, but that means like we go to textiles from algae, and that's. Yeah. Uh, so then textiles come in, uh, not only the plastics, uh, but also um, yeah, everything that we wear and uh, mm. s yeah. Maybe a word just uh, to give credit to the, the presentation and uh, the, about those other projects or textile um, photography. We're doing research with uh, um, Christophe Franken and uh, this Belgian photograph uh, uh, using the algae as a pigment, uh, so to replace all the chemicals that are used in photography processes. Um, researching all the, the amazing pigments that are contained in algae to produce uh, colors. Uh, we are developing a serigraphy ink. This uh, so this book is, uh, yeah, the, the cover is made with this um, uh, algae ink. 
Um, researching how to uh, dye textile. Uh, so this was a project in collaboration with Bureau Belen. We also we also so trying to make the fiber, as you said, uh, Jan. And this is happening at the moment because we got yeah we get messages right now. So they're uh, trying to hack the the machines of the lab and uh, the, trying to make this uh, yarn. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, it's the interesting uh, reuse of our knowledge in other materials. Um, I think that's interesting to mention. It's an event we had at the Design Week, and uh, it's it's more on the on the cultural side of algae. Uh, this was proposed by uh, Vera Scacabarozzi, Italian uh, landscape architect, uh, who uh, reenacted uh, ancient Mediterranean tradition, which says that people who didn't have enough to to eat uh, when the the, the fish. Um, the fishing was not uh, providing enough. Well, they used to go to the to the sea, to the coast, take a stone full uh, of algae and uh, shells and uh, everything, and make a soup out of it, adding some herbs. And we redid that in the in the glossy context of uh, Design Week, uh, Milan Design Week, which was, I think, a very beautiful moment because it was uh, this kind of the the soup of the poor that we shared with uh, with people. Uh, making a parallel between the, the primitive soup, which it is, and the primitive soup on Earth uh, three billion years ago when only the algae were uh, uh, living, the, the first organisms to live on, on the, uh, the Earth, and which led to, to life on Earth. So there was um, something very profound, I think, in it. And, um, algae have been around a lot, lot longer than people and will probably be around long after we've gone. So, uh, yeah, they're yeah. successful life forms, Albert. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's interesting to take... I, I, I know you, you like, wrote about thinking like forests, and I think like, trying to think like an algae is also a very interesting exercise because you have a, such a different time scale and, and strategy also and, of living. You, you're at the base have, of uh, the my, food my, chain. Uh, the you book know? that uh, Jan kindly mentioned has a rather long and boring title, but the title I wanted to call it was How to Be a Slime. And because a slime mold has this fantastic capacity to occupy its yeah. environment, adapt, very resilient, rather beautiful. And my publisher said, you and your three sad people might know what it means, but nobody else knows what it means. So no, you can't call it that. But I was very upset about that. Oh. Slime and algae yeah. are the future. I mean, it's no, yeah. you don't have to persuade me. So. Well, we, we will invite you again to uh, speak about slime then. <laughs> and. Yeah, those are images of the workshops, uh, pilot workshop we made in uh, Cairo, also in Istanbul. Uh, so using actually the material that we developed uh, with Eric and Marta uh, to approach local communities of designer and uh, inside them to work with it and to uh, make new objects which are uh, inspired by their cultures and express themselves to uh, this material. So that's one of the example, uh, bath mat, combining um, uh, so the algae-based um, bioplastic with uh, wood in order to make this uh, mm -hmm. yeah, mat. A shisha, another example uh, coming from the, uh, from the workshop. So, and you were involved in this, uh, in this workshop, right? To, uh, to ways, but so mostly uh, Harriette uh, Val. Yeah, 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 but I mean to guide around yeah. the material and also yes. raise awareness around the, uh, the algae. Yeah. So a very practical on printing, yeah. how to print <laughs> algae. Yeah. But that's, that's the beginning of this uh, spreading of the algae platform uh, through these different steps we are. Yeah. That's what I mean about learning from the past and from other cultures as well as learning from scientists. So when I was in Gujarat, which I mentioned on this journey, mm -hmm. uh, and we had a certain moment had a kind of soup made out of plants taken from what appeared to be a dead salt landscape. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is amazing, this is fantastic. And they thought I was very stupid to find it amazing because they've lived like that for many generations. But that's how we live. They said we take plants mm. from the land, and we have, you know, we, that's what we do. What's so clever about that? And I went, mm, I'm sorry, <laughs> but you know, so we kind of make romantic assumptions yeah. about uh, how clever we are. But there are other people for which it's very normal daily life knowledge. Mm. So we, it's how you combine them. That's mm. what the mm. exciting. Yeah, and um, why? Well, I don't know how you see that, uh, uh, Jan, for the future, but um, uh, it's not, with the different pilots we, s we make, we see it's not about replicating our uh, knowledge and formula, it's, it's about adapting it to the, uh, and trying to know the, the, 
specific contexts and people who have a different knowledge, as you say, who find it uh, totally normal to, uh, I don't know, eat plants or something like this. So to, really trying to uh, build this dialogue between the uh, um, community uh, and... Uh, yeah, so I think... Um, what we learned is uh, by not knowing, uh, you get uh, the most out of uh, things. So by not knowing and by uh, being curious and uh, open and explorative, uh, you, we, we learned the most uh, and we are learning the most. And it is this approach, this, uh, um, you could say, Atidi Luma approach of not understanding directly, not knowing, uh, also, like being an algae and going to another uh, region uh, or another landscape uh, and trying to be the algae there is like how that we want to let the atelier travel around the world. So, John, you have a new mission to no, try to, uh, to me is the, the most, put words on th that. This is the most uh, interesting question of the day for me is how do we learn from each other? Because things like algae are very place specific. They're unique, they, you know, they've evolved over a long period of time. But I had a very inspiring conversation just a few days ago with one of the founders of Ravelry. Have you, do you know Ravelry? Mm -hmm. Ravelry is a no. global community of people who are with fiber, knitting and wool. Mm -hmm. And basically five people who are very obsessed with sharing knowledge about patterns and materials, seven or eight years ago set this up as a kind of little, like a special interest group. They have six million members today. And there's still five people running this community. Mm -hmm. So I said, how do you uh, help? And they're all over the world, people who are obsessed by knitting and wool and fiber. Mm -hmm. And I said, how do, you, uh, uh, how do you manage or design this knowledge system? They said, we, I don't, we don't design anything. We just remove obstacles to people helping each other. So it's a very lightweight platform. Mm -hmm. And the basic obsession that people have is that they love wool, fiber, sheep, knitting patterns. That's what these six billion people share. So I think with with algae, it's going to be something similar. You know, how do you kind of let people share? That's why the openness of Atelier Luma is so important, yeah. that people can share you know, as, as easily as possible, yeah. and that the job of the organization is to make that easy for people to share. So, I mean, it, it, there are people all over the world doing algae experiments that you're going to meet, right? You, you can't meet them all instantly. Yeah. Or have you met them all? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably not a few. Yeah. <laughs> not at all, but, but yeah. I think it's also important to let them love something, no? Yeah. Eh? To let them get closer to it, to get it uh, understandable and visible and feasible and smell it and yeah. experience it. So I, yeah. But you can have learnings, no. for instance, in the it States should. from this kind of collection of algae yeah, showing more the kind of disbalance in nature that they use it as a kind of source. Or, um, and I think that's also can be learning for, uh, for Europe. I don't know if somebody would have a question about algae or, or how to join the Atelier Lumar. Or Everybody the algae became platform. algae on, in the meantime. <laughs> Everybody yes. is thinking like an algae. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, yeah, we hear you. Because we need for the. Mm. Uh, thank you for this really great uh, conversation. I, I had to step out for a moment, so I, I'm sorry if I missed something. Uh, but earlier, uh, Maya started out uh, by saying that perhaps the next step for Atelier Luma would be commercialization. And of course, uh, by commercialization, um, I, I, I think she meant just sort of putting its outcomes out into, out into the world, uh, outside this, your, your social fermentation um, lab. And, and so I, I wanted to ask, uh, first of all, what are the what, what are the uh, the challenges that need to be overcome to reach this sort of level of commercialization? But perhaps more importantly, what does uh, let's say success look like uh, when you think about commercializing this, uh, especially in, in the context of what you're saying, uh, John, about sort of um, uh, shrinking perhaps being. Uh, so sometimes more preferable to So the conversation I would like to have with BMW, if they ever talk to me, would be how can you source your insulation materials on a regional basis so that you don't, it's not a commodity. So I think what this is all about with fashion and with food and everything else is moving away from a commodity economy where the big brands of the world, their whole business model is to buy stuff as cheaply as possible 
add value through branding and then sell it for as much as possible. And there's no incentive for them to make the place where the, the product came from healthy. They don't care. So we have to find a way that the, the commodity is taken out of the equation, but people make a living out of using materials in a way that leaves the land healthier than when they started, which is it's kind of turning it upside down. But that, to me, is the commercialization that we need. We don't really need to just kind of find ways of selling algae products into new markets. That, I don't think, is a desirable one. It's not, not, not very interesting, anyway, for me. So basically, we just have to get rid of capitalism first, yeah. and then... No, yeah. this history is filled with economic activities that were regional in scale, and which trade, you know, my, you know the Hanseatic League, which is a kind of European, in the sort of 16th and 17th century, there were cities that traded with each other, but they were basically regional economies, and they kind of had ships going backwards and forwards all around Europe, and I think that we can have a modern version of that, in which bioregions basically provide most of their kind of needs locally, but then they do also exchange other stuff as well. I don't know what, but it's to do with having a global interaction of regions rather than these big unitary sort of commodity economies. That's the commodities are what kill us. Yeah. Uh, maybe to add on that is that uh, how that we see it, we are not producing products, we are producing knowledge. So uh, the products are like, uh, like John uh, already said before, a kind of um, uh, crystallizers of, uh, uh, of this, uh, they become symbols, they become metaphors of the knowledge that we are producing and they are the ambassadors maybe. So what we want with Atelier Luma is like uh, first is, is doing this, publish uh, results uh, where we show a certain attitude, how did you deal with the reality in a different way. So showing that, uh, and then by doing that, also creating an environment where that knowledge can be exchanged. So what kind of environment is that? Uh, how will that look? How do we construct that? This model, I don't have the answers at this moment. Uh, we will work on that. Um, and we will also do that in other places in the world where we will have the same conversations where uh, not the products will be exported to, but more like the models and the methodologies and the tactics and the strategies that we are developing. Um, then, um, and on top of that, we are at this moment, tomorrow, uh, as we speak, we also will have like a first conversation, and I don't know if it is the right conversation, like I don't know anymore what is right or wrong at this moment, um, that doesn't matter is, but that at least how can we calculate, for instance, the social impact of what we are doing, rather than only talking about uh, the economical uh, cost uh, um, of these products, and also starting to talk about the environmental cost. Can we also introduce that in the uh, economical system? So these are ideas that are out there, that are now on the, um, on the table of Atelier Luma, and where we hopefully in the future, maybe in one year, two years, uh, have answers on. So if we are there, uh, I think we, uh, I don't say we are there, uh, then I could say like that's for us success. I want to say, yeah, we had some small uh, elements or, or practical examples, such as the, the credit cards we made, and we, um, we replaced one by one the credit cards you have uh, around you, which are mostly out of this PVC, yeah, which is a very toxic uh, plastic. And then um, uh, we, we showed that we were able to injection mold this material uh, into these credit cards, and we were able to print it. So now it's actually... Um, injection molded 10,000 times and used by the whole Luma group uh, Eric, as a new can, can, you, can you inject some money into my credit card with your technology? That would be fantastically yeah, no, helpful. It's, it's not for paying. It's, uh, it's only printed, so it only has your photo on it. So maybe that will help. Just keep working. <laughs> no, it no, are indeed these kind of small uh, um, elements you will also see next year in the building. Uh, Caroline Bianco is working with a whole team uh, of researchers on that really to uh, make applications that are will be applied uh, just like it works it's not that uh, uh, it's it's not that easy but uh, it's possible yeah. 
Yeah, I just would like to add something. I think what, uh, what is quite also interesting and beautiful on the, um, the research that we are doing is that we are not only researching on one material each time, but when you, after a few months, few years, you can also see that the, um, the ecosystem, the natural ecosystem that you have in the region can bring also qualities and element that after that we can combine all together. For example, uh, the algae gets like uh, some a certain qualities, but the sunflower also give us like a kind of glue that after that we are using and combining it all together. Mm -hmm. And so, um, of course, that that is quite difficult to um, define for those material what could be like the right application. Uh, I'm also questioning um, how we can go to a certain application. Is it the material that we have to bring to a certain level to get an application or is it the research that we are using like that with the right way, something quite strict and, uh, and beautiful and after that we are just finding something, perhaps an application that it doesn't exist at the moment. I don't know. But uh, that is work that we are doing uh, right now. I think that will be the conclusion. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. Right? Yeah. Okay. Merci, Joanna. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you also.